Hi, Grace. Can you believe there's only five days left until Christmas? That's crazy, right? I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm still stuck in March. <laughs> but if Christmas this year is something that is stressing you out, or if you're just really upset about the whole situation, today's service is for you. I want to invite you to sit back and relax, try to get rid of all the distractions, and let's together focus on what's really important, Jesus. We're gonna sing a couple of songs and then I'll be right back to share something really cool with all of you.
Father God, thank you so much um, for this time of year. Lord, it's a time of hope. Um, and we just thank you uh, for that. And Lord, um, as we come into the season, Lord, as we come closer to Christmas Day, just we ask for your presence, especially during this time. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's John uh, now with a baby dedication. Hello, Grace family. Krista and I are absolutely thrilled because, yes, we're getting to you in just a moment. Because just almost two years ago, Danny and Stacy Houston were married. And now, look at this. It is Abigail Estelle's one-year birthday, and we are dedicating her today. Everybody, here's the thing about the Bible. As you read the Bible, you realize it's the great love of God that created all of life. And today, what we're talking about is the love that Danny and Stacy have for each other created life. That reflects God. So, Danny and Stacy have chosen a scripture, a very special scripture, and have written their own blessing over Abigail Estelle. So, would you uh, read those two pieces now? Yes. Abigail, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Abigail, may you chase after God's heart all the days of your life. May your purpose be clear and your gifts be plentiful. We pray you move in kindness, love and compassion and see all people as God has created them to be seen. We pray you follow your intuition while seeking God's word. May you remember that you are loved unconditionally by mama and dada, and above all, by God. That's wonderful. Everybody, we're gonna anoint Abigail Estelle now. Abigail Estelle, anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful life for Abigail Estelle. God, may she always chase after your heart. May you give her discernment to know which way to go. What is your path for her? May you give Danny and Stacy tremendous wisdom in raising this beautiful life. God, may you bless her and keep her Make your face to shine upon her. Lord, would you lift your countenance always upon Abigail and Snow, that she would know your peace. We dedicate her to you, Lord, all of us together, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now, everybody, something special. The Lion King moment. Okay, Mom and Dad, you straighten out the dress. Okay, you are going to get to see a nice big smile. Okay, here she comes. Way! Ha 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 Wonderful, you did great. Yeah, you did great. <laughs> Every year, Grace Community Church hosts an event called Hunger to Hope. Hunger to Hope, it's a meal packing event in partnership with an organization called Feed My Starving Children. We come together as a church and we spend the whole Sunday packing meals to feed communities across the globe. Well, this year, we're not meeting. We're not coming together. We're not gonna spend a whole Sunday packing meals, but we are still getting those meals out because one thing that COVID didn't stop was the need for food. And we wanna meet that need and we wanna help our communities. So this year, we sponsored 200,000 meals with Feed My Starving Children. They have their warehouse with a lot of machines that are packing the meals instead of volunteers. And I just wanna share with you how something this little, like this package, can have a major impact in communities across the world. Check out this clip. FMSC food really is the fuel for everything that happens in our child development model. Without a meal, there's no education. There's no economic empowerment. To us, feeding a kid is the beginning of really having an impact in a community, in a family, and in a country. The food each month is so vitally important. If we did not receive the food each month and feed my starving children, 
people were literally starved to death, and especially the children. The partnership that we have is literally saving people. In our daily programs, our community transformation, the 90 kindergartens that we run, that food is just an essential piece. Feed the Hungry is able to serve in excess of 12,000 kids every day, Congolese refugees that are in school and are hearing the gospel and getting basic foundational needs met because of the partnership with FMSC. There's 426 schools and orphanages that we get to serve because of FMSC. These are kids that otherwise wouldn't be in school. These are kids that otherwise probably wouldn't be eating much at all. Well, we say empty bed cannot stand. So if, uh, if the person is hungry, how can you even talk to them when they, they can't even pay attention? If you were starving, your children were starving, all you would think about is where can I get a little bit of rice for my children. That's all you think about. And to be able to give them the Feed My Starving food that is with the nutritional things that are in it, 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 it saves lives because they're able to easily digest it and be able to bring their health up and their digestive system up where they can become a healthy person. Without that food, in many cases, children would die. So then that, that food really helps take them into the development aspect and allows them to be able to get those skills, to get that education, so that they can be able to go out and get a job or start that business and do those things that allow them to be economically self-sufficient. Realmente estarían muy agradecido con ustedes como lo están con Dios porque a través de ustedes están ayudando a alimentar muchos niños en todo el mundo. I'm picturing our, like our orphan kids dancing. They'd be incredibly thankful. They'd sit here and say, you guys fill our bellies. Thank you. God will bless you for what you're doing and keep it up. A lot of the kids would say thank you for life. That package of food to them represents life. The people who have done the packing, the people, the donors who have given money to make sure that the food has come, we say thanks so much. Rest assured, we'll continue doing this work as long as you are with us, ministering, and actually is the ministering the word of God through giving. So God bless you. Thank you guys so much for your incredible generosity. I love to know that our congregation is always so ready to come together and support communities across the world. And I'm looking forward to the next time we can pack these again and we can continue to turn hunger into hope. Now we have a Grace family to read today's passage. In, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made His, do his dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the, one, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hey Grace family, thank you so much for being here today. Today is December 20th. Have you bought all of your Christmas presents? I hope you have, we're just a few days away from Christmas. I've got my red sweater on because the red sweater is tradition. Tradition for the past 20 years, yes, Grace Community Church on Christmas Eve this year. Please join us for our Christmas Eve service. We are going on location to the exact place where Grace Community Church began 20 years ago. Christmas Eve 2020, be our 20th anniversary. So please join us for that. But it has always been for tradition for the past 20 years that on the Sunday right before Christmas, it's the red sweater. On Christmas Eve, tradition, black suit. I will be in a black suit this Christmas Eve as always. Well, listen, uh, we just had a reading of John chapter 1, and you can see from that reading, if you're familiar with the first book of the Bible, Genesis, then you recognized a, an important link with the reading here, because John chapter 1, in the beginning, 
was the word Genesis in the beginning, same thing. Scholars say it's a midrash, which what's a midrash? That's a commentary on a book of the Bible. So John is giving his commentary. There's four biographies of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is John's version of the Christmas story, and it is a commentary on the book of Genesis. Now, what have we been focused on? We have been focusing on the very, very central and important need of all of humanity, and that is the need to belong, the need for connection, that we struggle, all of us, all of humanity struggles with loneliness, this sense of something's not quite right, this sense of disconnection. It's really important. And how do we solve this? How do we solve the need that all people have to be connected, to feel this wholeness? Now, you see the Christmas lights there behind me and I'm holding a light bulb. I want you to think about electricity, electricity in your home and how it is. it needs to run on a circuit. That's how electricity goes. So this light bulb gets fired up because a circuit, a closed and complete circuit of electricity flows to it and back and it just goes around and around and around. And what happens is, When this light bulb is not working, it's because there's a break or a short somewhere in that circuit. Now, home, shalom, this Jewish word that we've talked about, shalom. Interesting. Shalom means to be complete or to be whole. In other words, the circuit is whole. It's complete. It hasn't been shorted out somewhere. Where the break is, where the shorting is, and isn't interesting that the word sin means to fall short, where the break is, is causing there to be a lack of lighting up the bulb, a lighting up of the Christmas lights. There's where the problem is. So we have to close the circuit. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet says, he sees God and he says, God is a wheel within a wheel. So there's a circuiting. You look at our earth, our earth circuits the sun, the solar system circuits, and we are meant to also circuit, to be in a closed circuit, a complete circuit. Fascinating that John Milton, when he wrote his epic poem, Paradise Lost, which sealed him as a great writer, he's writing about paradise in the book of Genesis. And and he links, he links Satan to loneliness. What is loneliness? Loneliness is a break, a short in the circuit. So this is what we're after. There's the background to all this. How do we close the circuit? How do we move towards it? So this is what we said uh, so far in this series is that polarity does not work. Polarity will not close the circuit. Polarity actually opens the circuit up more. It it shorts the circuit even more. It comes natural to us. We think, okay, look, I'm just going to get around people who are just like me. I'm going to polarize from other people. Now I can really belong, but it's not working. I mean, it comes natural and we're doing it and we're polarizing more and more. And yet we're finding ourselves farther and farther from home, lonelier and lonelier. Paradox works. Jesus is a paradox. We follow Jesus, which means we're following a paradox That actually brings us home, huh? Interesting. What did we say last week? Responsibility, that the book of Genesis presents to us four clear areas where humanity was irresponsible. There was personal, moral, collective, ontological. And every single time we make that choice to be irresponsible in that way, we are breaking the circuit. Over and over and over again, we're feeling this massive disconnection in our lives. Now. I did not mention one really, really important area of responsibility, and that is the responsibility to actually respond to the very love of God. And that's what I want to focus on today. When we respond when we say, you know what, that's it. I understand God's love, and now I'm going to make that response. And my question is going to be, have you responded? Because as you respond to the incredible love of God, When you respond, when you say, that's it, I am going to respond to God's love, there's where the transformation begins. There's where the true self is found. And there is where the circuit begins to close and the lights come on. There is a light inside of you. 
and it comes on. Now, I think about, when I think about this, I really think a lot about my father-in-law, Big Russ, who passed away a couple years ago. He believed, he believed in God, he believed in God's love, but he never fully, truly responded. And finally, one day he said, you know what, that's it. It's kind of like that drawer in your house. We've got one in our kitchen and it's a total mess. And one day you say, you know what, that's it. In my home right now, uh, in our hallway upstairs, we have a light that's out. And I just week after week, I'm just letting it go. I'm saying, you know, one day I'll change it. And finally, I can say, that's it. Or that corner in the garage or whatever it might be, a mess. I've got a bunch of papers that need to be filed on top of our filing cabinet. And you know what? One day, they hadn't hit yet, but one day soon, I'm going to finally say, that's it. I'm filing all that stuff. I'm asking that maybe today would be your day. You would say, you know what? That's it. I know about the love of God. I believe in God. But you know what? Today is the day that I'm going to respond to the inevitable, powerful, transforming love of God and say, that's it. Today's the day. I'm going to explain that more, but first I want to say this, that Christmas is absolutely inevitable. John chapter one, the reason I said a few moments ago is that it is a midrash or a commentary in the book of Genesis is because Genesis tells us right from the very first chapter, it lets us know that Christmas is inevitable because God's love is inevitable, that Jesus is coming, he's gonna show up, there's no doubt about it, and you get that from Genesis chapter one. Now, if you could read Hebrew, and maybe some of you do, I don't, I have to rely on scholars who are fluent in Hebrew. If I could read Hebrew, then I would know that there is this huge wash of sevens, 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 because it's all about a covenant. Covenant is an unbreakable promise. God is like saying, I am, I am just cementing myself. I am bound. I am committed in an unbreakable promise to all of my creation. That's you and that's me. And because of that, doesn't matter what we do, doesn't matter how much we disrespect or reject or fail to meet our promises to God, that his love is coming. And so Jesus is going to show up. That's why Christmas is absolutely inevitable in our lives. That's what I hope to show us today. Now, I want to point something out in verse number five of John chapter one. And it says this, the light shines, the light, Jesus, light stands for anything that's good. Light, love, life, it stands for anything that's good. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. That simply means this, is that Jesus Christ is coming and there's nothing you or I can do to stop Jesus from showing up. There's nothing we can do to stop Christmas from happening. It's like the sun rising. It's like the dawning of a new day. I can't stop it. and You can't stop it. There's nothing can stop it. It's going to happen. As I said a second ago, doesn't matter how many times I disrespect or reject or fail to keep my promises to God, God is going to show up in your life and in my life. His love is going to break through no matter what. Now, I want to go back to something that I learned early on in Bible college very foundational theology 101. If you've been around church for a long time, you've probably heard it. Or if you've never been to church before and today is the first day you've ever shown up to church, maybe you've heard a hint of it or you've thought it somehow because it's a thought of humanity. So here it is. God needs nothing. God needs nothing. What do you think about that? I've heard it all my life. God needs, he doesn't need me, doesn't need you. God needs absolutely nothing. I want to read to you a verse from Psalm number 50 that kind of sort of supports that, that thought, that theological thought. Psalm 50 verses nine and then verse 12 say, I have no need, God speaking, I have no need of a bull from your stall or a goat from your pen. And then goes on, God says, God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. And a lot of theologians use that in other places in the Bible say that God is self-sustained. He doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. God doesn't need anything at all. Now, that's kind of sort of maybe a polemic against this thought that all of the myths that exist in those days when this was written, that the gods created humanity because the gods needed slaves 
to serve them, to feed them, and to sacrifice to them. And yet God creates humanity in the book of Genesis, not because God needs something from us, but because of love. That we have been created out of the love of God. Now, we see that because humanity reflects that. Remember, we're in the image of God, is that when a man and woman, when they come together and they make love, they create life. And God, out of love, creates life. So humanity comes together. When we make love, we create life. And God creates life. John, 1 John, actually, chapter 4, says this so well. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that We love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What is sins? Broken connection, short circuit, out of relationship, no longer circling. God sent his son to sacrifice for those shortnesses in our lives that are actually making our lives a total mess that we don't want. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we are also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love, and here it comes, is made complete. The circuit is no longer broken. The electricity is flowing. The lights come on. The circuit is complete. His love is made complete in us. First of all, everybody, God is love and love is needy. I don't completely agree with this foundational thought that was communicated to me that God needs nothing. God is love and love is needy because love needs to give love. That's why you and I exist because love needs to give love. Love is compelled to give love. Love has a passion to give love away. Now there's an old story. Maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't. But this happened, I don't think, I think the setting for this was maybe like 100, 150 years ago. It was about a young married couple. They had no money. Man, they were so poor, but Christmas time was coming and they agreed with each other. You know what? We're not going to give gifts. We're not because we are so, so poor. We're not going to give gifts. The one thing that the wife had was her long hair. She didn't have much of anything because they were so poor, but she had long hair. And the one thing that the husband has is he had a beautiful watch, but he didn't have a chain to put it on, but he had a watch. So they agree, we're not going to give something to each other, but you know what? They loved each other so much that secretly she went and she sold her hair. That's why I'm saying this is like 100, 150 years ago, has her hair cut off. She sells her hair to buy a gold chain for the one possession that her husband has, and that's the watch. And what does he do? He goes and he sells his watch, unbeknownst to her, to buy a beautiful clip that went in her hair. And on Christmas Day, here they come and present this. She's cut off her hair, and he presents the clip. He has sold his watch, and she presents she presents the chain that goes to the watch. You know why? Because even though they agreed to this, Love is needy because love has a very, very strong passion, a need to give love. God is love, so God has a passion. God is needy. He needs to shower his love on you and to shower his love on me, and that is why Christmas is absolutely inevitable. It's coming like a freight train, and it absolutely cannot be stopped. Now, I was looking at Washingtonian Magazine recently. I don't know how many of you check out Washingtonian Magazine, but there was a Q&A in there with Arthur Brooks. Arthur Brooks, who is uh, on the faculty at Harvard, uh, he's doing this Q&A in Washingtonian, and I found it fascinating. So I actually listened to a podcast he did with a social scientist recently, and they were talking in this pod, they were talking in his podcast. And this guy, this side, I think he's like University of California. I can't quite remember, but I totally remember what he said. He said, isn't it fascinating, Arthur, that we, the moment we, like for those of us who have kids, right? This 
this thing that takes place. He said, "All this, you're presented in a moment's time. You, your first introduction to this child of yours in the delivery room is they're slimy and they're screaming. And boom, this child is handed to you and you have just met them and they're screaming and they're slimy. And your first thought is, I'll die for you. Like you didn't think that when you met your spouse for the first time. You didn't think that when you met anybody for the first time. But boom, put into your arms is this child slimy and screaming. And your first thought is, I will die for you. It's a powerful emotion. It's an immediate emotion. And it comes from love because you are ready not just to give a hair clip or a, or a watch, a, a, a watch band, a, a, the, the, the cord for the watch. You're not ready. To, you're not ready just to give that. You're ready to give your entire life because that love is so powerful. That's a tiny glimpse. That is a very tiny glimpse of God's powerful love. God is very needy because God loves you so much. God is compelled. God is compelled to give. Now, I was at a conference not too long ago and a guy who was a senior VP for Coca-Cola was speaking uh, to us. He's talking about his time at Coke. He spent a lot of time at Coke and then he transitioned an important point in his life and he left Coca-Cola and he went to the baby Einstein company. And so obviously they cater to families who have young kids. And he said he realized that nobody had ever done an extensive study because his job at Coke was doing all kinds of research data about how to get people to change or what makes people cause them to make these decisions of change in life. So he goes to baby Einstein and he realized, Nobody's ever done this extensive study on young married couples who have just had kids. And he says, he found that fascinating because young married couples who have just had kids have a major transformation in their life. He says, just think about this for a second. He's got, you got a young, hip, cool couple, and they say three very strong things. They say, you know what? We will never live in the suburbs because they live where all the cool people are in the middle of the city. We'll never live in the suburbs. We will never, ever, ever drive a minivan and we will never, ever quit our jobs no matter what. He said, then they get pregnant and they have a baby and within a week they've moved to the suburbs, they've bought a minivan and they're arguing about who is gonna get to quit their job to stay home with the baby because they love the baby so much. That this baby that they've met slimy and screaming, they're ready to die for, has totally transformed their lives. That this love that is come into their lives that they have responded to and opened their arms to and wrapped their arms around this child has completely transformed them. That their lives have been turned upside down and things they said they'd never do, they absolutely do because that love is so transformative. Isn't that fascinating? What I want to ask you today, have you ever come to that point where you say, you know what, that's it. Today's the day. I'm going to fully respond to the powerful and transformative love of God. Most of us, as I, as I talk and as I read about people, one common thing I hear all, all the time is, you know what, I feel there's a true self inside of me that's just waiting to come out, waiting to be discovered. The way it's discovered is by closing the circuit and allowing the light to come on, by responding fully to the love of God. Have you done that? I wanna ask you that you would do that today. So I would like to pray for you, but I really want to pray something very specific. I, I, I want to ask you to consider doing this day or just thinking very deeply, have you ever done this? Christ's love for you is enormous. And when you say, that's it, I'm going to respond. You're closing that circuit like the light is coming on inside of you. So I want to ask that you would pray something with me along these lines. God, today is the day. That's it. I'm fully responding. I just don't believe in your love. I am responding to your love today. I am fully taken in it. God, I'm not gonna be perfect. That's not saying I'm perfect from this point on. I'm not gonna be perfect. But what is going to be for sure is my response today that your love for me is transformative and I am receiving that transformative love and I am fully embracing it, that the light might come on in my life. All kinds of stuff might happen from here, 
but I am embracing the fact that your love for me is perfect and complete. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as so many of us are praying right now, God, we know, we know we're going to need your grace because we will never be perfect, but we are embracing and fully responding to your perfect love for us, and we will rest assured in that complete circuit of your love. From this point on, we fully embrace that, God, that we might be our true selves. Thank you, Lord, for your transformative, perfect love. In Christ's name, amen. Everybody, we are going to end today with that famous Christmas hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. We want to tell it on the mountain that God's love is awesome. So please sing it out loud and proud with us now. Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ so much for joining us. Please stick around to learn what it means to be a church for people who don't go to church. Have a good one. Thanks so much for joining our service today. I just want to take a few moments uh, here at Christmas time. What a wonderful time to say a few things about Grace Community Church. Christmas is all about Jesus. It's all about Christ. Grace only does three things, Christ, compassion, community. So if you have never been to Grace before, this is your first time, I wanna explain something in less than five minutes about Grace Community Church. 
Those are the only three things we do. We do them all the time. Christ is at the center of everything, like Christ is at the center of Christmas. Christ is the catalyst for community and for compassion. Compassion for us is service. There are three very clear ways that people grow spiritually, and that is number one, understanding who Jesus Christ clearly is. Once he is understood, it's just a major catalyst to our spiritual growth that's clear in the Bible and that's clear in all kinds of studies. From there, from Jesus being the beginning of everything, community, Christ changes our relationships. It just transforms our relationship. The more we understand about Jesus, the more we learn about Jesus in his proper context, it is transformative to our relationships. We need relationships. The series we're in is about loneliness. It is so important that we get in Christ-centered, Christ-inspired relationships. And then compassion, that's serving. We have in this series that we're in, we have talked about the fact that the studies show, the books that we've discussed during this series, they show that when people serve, it actually helps them to repair the disconnection that we feel on the inside. So this church, we only do three things, Christ, compassion, and community. And when we put those three in place, it just moves us to a place that we all really long to be, a place that is whole and complete. So we invite you to be a part of this journey with us. We just can't wait to see where God's gonna take us next. And lastly, I just wanna say Merry Christmas. Thanks for joining us today. God bless.